Okay, it's 6.30 and we will start the... This conference will now be recorded. Transportation TPPC meeting. Uh, we'll start with Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Roll call, please. David Couch. Here. Kirsten Helton. Here. Kyle Blades. <coughs> John Crump. Here. Sally Tafoya. Here. Monique Flores. Here. Marshall Cryer. Here. Michael Navarro. Here. Nick Lisenovich. Here. Cindy Parra. I'm here. Kathy Prout. I know she's here. I see you online, Kathy. It's fine. Uh, Gilberto Reyna. Here. Zach Scrivener. Here. Bob Smith. I'm here. Phil Smith. Here. Olivia Trujillo. And Veronica Vasquez. Thank you. Thank you. Public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the committee on any matter not on this agenda but under the jurisdiction of the committee. Committee members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may ask a question for clarification, make a referral to staff for factual information, or request staff to report back to the committee. At a later meeting, speakers are limited to two minutes. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making a presentation. Do we have any public here that would like to speak? Seeing none, do we have any online? No, we do not. Okay, thank you. Special action item, Assembly Bill 361, authorizing teleconferencing under certain conditions, Ms. Napier. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. This is our item that allows us to continue to have virtual and uh, in-person meetings. Uh, the period for this uh, resolution is April 21st. I'm sorry, my dates are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> May 19th it's to June 18th. It's, it's May 19th to, to June 18th. To June 18th, yes. <laughs> thank you. How did I do that? I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> anyway, we're asking that uh, the board ado uh, adopt resolution number 22-22, uh, I believe it is. Thank you. I have a motion. Second. Roll call vote, please. David Couch. Yes. Kirsten Helton. Yes. Kyle Blades. Aye. John Crump. Yes. Sally Tafoya. Yes. Monique Flores. Yes. Orshel Cryer. Yes. Michael Navarro. Yes. Nick Lisanovich. No. Cindy Parra. Yes. Kathy Prout. Gilberto Reyna. Yes. Zach Scrivener. Aye. Bob Smith. Yes. Phil Smith. Yes. Thank you. Presentations. Golden Empire Transit District is introducing an innovative paratransit service changing beginning July 1. Presentation. Okay, so we're having technical difficulties there, so we will switch and see if Brian Godby with Godby Research will present the finding of the 2022 Community Survey. Yes, I just have to switch to presenters, so just a moment. 
Brian, if you didn't hear that, we're bringing you up now. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Becky. Okay, you should be the presenter now. Okay, everybody should be able to see the screen. Yes, it's up. Thank you. All right, great. <clears throat> thank you. All right, uh, so uh, let's uh, jump into this. As uh, you all know, we've done this survey uh, uh, for many years now, and we're pleased to be here again this evening to present the results. <clears throat> uh, first of all, in terms of the methodology, just a quick overview. Uh, this was a telephone and online survey, which means that we were calling people, but it also means that we were intentionally text messaging and emailing people. It doesn't mean we just posted a link on Facebook and took whoever we could get. We sp had a specific sample and we were inviting those people uh, either again by the phone or online um, by text and email to that online survey. So uh, it, it's all very controlled. The likely universe was um, uh, adults 18 plus in the county, uh, about 640,000 plus. Uh, the, we were in the field from February 13th through February 28th. The average survey was 21 minutes long uh, on the phone, which is still our metric for gauging that, uh, the survey length. Uh, we completed uh, 1,343 interviews, and you can see the breakdown by invitation type, uh, phone, landline, uh, and text, uh, online messaging. Uh, and 58 interviews were conducted in Spanish. Uh, and all of that leads to a margin of error of plus or minus 2.67%. <clears throat> uh, moving to the key findings, uh, the first question in this survey was uh, favorability of um, how the community is doing addressing the COVID crisis. Uh, and as you can see here, when you have the variant somewhat together, uh, we have 54% in round numbers that are favorable uh, versus 37 percent unfavorable and about 10 percent that don't know. The next question was one that we've asked over uh, many years and you can see a selection of those years. It actually goes back before 2014 uh, but it won't fit on the slide. It is available uh, in more detail in the report uh, so uh, you can look at the information there as well. It's uh, uh, something that staff already has. Uh, and when we look at the um, quality of life now, and we add the variance somewhat together, you see we're at 61% uh, favorable, which is up a little bit from last year where it was 56%. Uh, and about where we were in 2020, what's notable in the timing of the surveys is we were in the field in February of 2022, and that's before the COVID crisis turned into a lockdown uh, in California. So um, it, that was before COVID in essence, <clears throat> 21 is during COVID and then now we're back to that same level pre-COVID. Uh, if we go back further, there has been a bit of a decline um, in, in previous years uh, as well, but obviously it's not related to, to the pandemic. <clears throat> Uh, another question that we've asked repeatedly is their outlook on the future quality of life. Uh, and if we can add the variance somewhat, or much better and somewhat better together, we're at 29% uh, in the current survey. That's a little bit up from last year. Again, probably the same reason uh, where we were 27%. Uh, and back in 2020, we were at 31%. Uh, which was a little bit higher than 2019, where we were at 30% uh, as well. So with rounding, just about the same. Uh, the next couple questions were, what do you like less, most and least about your city or town? <clears throat> and again, we've asked this over time, uh, and you see the bars, the green is the current survey, the blue is last year, and the gold is 2020. Uh, the responses haven't changed dramatically. There's a little bit of moving around, uh, but small town atmosphere has been uh, at the top or the top for the last three years, followed by cost of living. Um, again, this was done in February, so it's before uh, the instability in the uh, 
gas prices worldwide and in California. Um, so, you know, that might be different today. <clears throat> Cost of housing uh, was number three on the list. Number four was location. Uh, number five was sense of community. Uh, next, natural resources, then farming and agriculture, safe neighborhoods and communities, and weather and climate. <clears throat> Uh, the list continued. This was an open-ended question, so we took their responses, coded them together, uh, and you see that we're to the bottom end of the list where things are approaching the margin of error. So they're not quite as important as those things on the previous page. The next question was, what do you like least about uh, your city or town? Uh, and the top of that list was uh, homelessness. Uh, and that was at 52%. It was a little bit lower than the previous year, where it was 54 uh, and 53 in the year before that. Statistically, they're all basically tied. So homelessness continues to be the top concern um, about people's individual towns or uh, cities. Uh, crime rate was number two, air quality three, gang violence was number four, job opportunities, housing affordability, growth plan and planning, and then COVID response um, at the bottom of this first slide. Uh, again, this was a longer uh, set of responses that we got. <clears throat> Traffic congestion uh, at the top of the next slide, lack of community resources, cost of living as a negative, not as a positive, obviously, but it's not as, uh, there aren't as many people saying cost of living is a problem as there were people saying it was a good thing in their community. <clears throat> Uh, and then on down the list from there. Uh, the next set of questions uh, were ones that we've added over, uh, over and over again, and it's a, a relatively long list. We've summarized it here. Again, it's in the full report, um, but basically what we're saying is, you know, how important are these issues over the next 20 years to you? Uh, we do a scale, uh, and basically that's the numbers you see here to the left of the bulleted items, 3.61, et cetera. That's how we rank these items. Uh, but at the top of this list was improving the quality of public education. Uh, preserving water supply was next. Improving crime prevention and gang prevention programs was third. Fourth was uh, maintaining local streets and roads. Fifth was improving water quality, uh, then improving air quality and then creating more high paying jobs. Again, there's a lot of detail in the full report about all these items as well as all the others and how they have changed uh, you know, a little bit over the years. Uh, the next question was, what's your primary uh, transportation used to travel to and from work? Obviously mode choice. Uh, and at the top of this list, we have drive alone at 73%. That's a little higher than last year and the year before, where we were at 68% in round numbers. Uh, again, probably somewhat due to the pandemic uh, in those two years, although you could argue that um, in 2020, it was right before that happened. Uh, then in the red bar is 2019. It was lower at 64% uh, and 81 and 74 previous to that. Uh, not working and retired, uh, obviously, is a big chunk of people. So, and the survey was of everybody, not just um, those under 65. So, 11% um, in the retired category, 6% said carpool or vanpool, 6% uh, in round numbers said uh, work from home, don't work outside the home, 5% uh, said autonomous or self driving car. That's sort of their definition of what that might be. Um, and it's sort of changed, uh, it's a moving target, obviously. <clears throat> Walking, 5%, uh, Uber or Lyft, uh, some sort of ride share or situation um, there at 3%. Uh, obviously, that's right at the margin of error, so it's really not significant. Uh, next question was, would you consider riding a scooter or e-bike as a primary mode of transportation? 24% said that they would consider that. Um, and 68% uh, said they would not. Now, this is of uh, those people that were commuters in the previous question, so we didn't include the, the retired people, um, obviously, <clears throat> uh, because we're talking about primary mode choice. 
Uh, next was, would you consider riding a scooter or e-bike as part of another transportation mode? So, you know, either a second part or a third part, however it might work for their particular commute. 37% said they would consider it. 56% uh, said they would not. Uh, and 7% didn't know. So that sort of suggests that, uh, that it really doesn't work as a sole mode, but there are some people, some more people that become interested in it as part of another mode of transportation. And again, detailed cross tabs have more information on that in the detailed report. Uh, the next question was, uh, have you uh, begun telecommuting or working from home uh, with the COVID crisis? Uh, and as you can see here, 29% said yes this year, but it was 33% uh, last time, last year. Uh, so it has actually dropped down. Uh, it was a little bit higher last year, and that that's not really quite statistically significant, but it's certainly varying the way we would expect it, uh, given the stage in the crisis that we're at. Uh, next question was, of those that were telecommuting, would you continue uh, telecommuting or working from home after the crisis? Uh, 47, for, I'm sorry, 45% rounding said that they would uh, in 21 that was just 31 percent so that number has gone up uh, more people would consider um, telecommuting uh, now after the crisis is uh, is abated <clears throat> uh, and we then also asked those people who said that they would what the reasons for uh, continuing to telecommute uh, and at the top of that list again this is of those people who would telecommute not of everybody but they said saving the environment, helping prevent climate change. Uh, that was 15% of those who would telecommute. Uh, saving time was 15%. Saving money was 14%. Uh, my company is requiring working from home is 13%. Saving gas uh, was 9%. Again, this is before gas, I mean, gas prices have certainly gone up uh, since the fall of last year. Uh, when we were in the field in February, but they hadn't gone up as much as they have since uh, the war in Ukraine started in, in the beginning of March. So it'd be interesting to see if that had changed uh, if we were in the field today. Uh, putting uh, fewer miles on my car at 4% and from there we're into the other responses. Uh, next question was uh, of those that are commuters and rating the overall traffic flow in their city or town. Uh, and uh, of the entire audience, you can see here that 8% uh, said it's excellent, 31% said that it was good, uh, and 41% said it's fair, uh, and 20% said it was poor. Uh, and that's not really changed dramatically. It's a little bit more excellent and good this year than it was in the previous year. Uh, in the previous year, the fair category was higher uh, and then, but it, we are higher, I think, than the 2020 uh, year. Um, and, you know, why that is, uh, you might, the transportation experts would know better, uh, but that's the perception of what's going on. <clears throat> and next question was, uh, what's the most likely alternative transportation mode? And this was just asked of those people who already said they would drive alone in the earlier question. Uh, and again, the majority of those people, 64% of those people who drive alone already say they would continue to drive alone. 23% uh, said that they would use an electric vehicle uh, if workplace charging stations were available. Now that's still probably drive alone, but it's just obviously not a gas vehicle, it's a, an electric vehicle. Uh, bike uh, or electric bike was at 16%. Uh, carpool or van pool was at 15%, autonomous self-driving car at 12, uh, and express bus at 12 as well. <clears throat> Next question was uh, switch gears and we started talking about housing. We first asked people what their current housing type was. Uh, and you see here that 35% are saying that they have a single family home uh, with a small yard. Uh, 46% say that they have a single family home with a large yard. There are some little minor changes from year to year, uh, but um, in the last 
uh, three or so, it really hasn't been significant. Uh, townhouse, or, townhouse or condominium is 4%. Oops, sorry about that. Shifting too much. Uh, and then the next slide is the remainder of the questions. A building uh, with offices, a mixed use situation uh, at, at less than 1%. An apartment at uh, 14 percent, uh, and then don't know, no answer. Uh, you know, in the single digits. Now that question was really asked, so we could ask the follow up, and would you, what would be your change? Uh, and again, in the detailed um, report and cross tabs, there's a lot more information on this. Um, but uh, uh, in short, uh, the 35 percent said that they would definitely go for a small a single family home with a small yard and another 39% said that they would probably do that uh, so that's a substantial amount uh, you know on the order of 75 76% single family home with a large yard though is a, a bigger number with 59% saying uh, they would definitely go for that large yard uh, and 23% saying that they probably would <clears throat> Uh, when we look at the choices for townhouse, townhouse or condominium, uh, it's much smaller. People are preferring, obviously, the single-family homes uh, as they have in the past. 16% definitely at a condominium, 29% uh, uh, probably, uh, and then a mixed-use development of some sort, 9% definitely, 22% probably. Uh, and as we get into the <clears throat> final part of the slide and picking an apartment, uh, just 12% uh, saying definitely yes, and 21% uh, saying probably yes. Again, not much changes uh, across time with these. Uh, the next slide shows you how the current situation changes depending on the choices. So people who have a single family home with a small yard, 80% uh, of them said that they would stay with that choice. 73% uh, said that they would uh, opt for a larger yard, uh, and then just 39% said that they would go of uh, these single-family home with a small yard dwellers said that they would switch to a town, um, would consider a townhome or a, uh, <clears throat> a condominium uh, and smaller numbers for the other options. Uh, the highlights in green are the big numbers. Uh, <clears throat> so of those people that have a, a single-family home with a large yard uh, the big number was 85% would stay with that same configuration, a single family home with a large yard. <clears throat> People that are in a townhome or a condominium now, 81% uh, would like to move up to a single family home with a small yard, 72% <clears throat> uh, a single family home with a large yard, uh, and 78% would stay in the same configuration. Uh, the other items were fewer numbers of people in the columns, so they're not really as significant, but we've highlighted the numbers anyway. Uh, the next question was uh, really a demographic that we moved up earlier in the survey uh, because we wanted to ask a couple following questions about uh, multiple units. And uh, so in this survey, we see that 39% uh, said that they, um, are uh, <clears throat> renting their home and 59% say that they own their home. <clears throat> so that gave us the ability to ask the, a follow-up question, which was, have you seen, heard, or read anything about a new law allowing single family home lots to have two units or duplex? First awareness of the issue uh, and 22% said they were aware, but uh, overwhelming 74% were not. <clears throat> Uh, and then the follow-up to that was, would you consider living in a home that shares a lot with another house or duplex? Uh, and 35% said that they would, would uh, and 54% said that they would not. So still a majority that would not uh, take that option. And then, oops, sorry about that. Uh, then the next question was, would you consider building a second dwelling unit or converting 
your home to a duplex. So now this was only asked of homeowners, which is why we had the own rent question earlier. Uh, and 28% uh, said, yes, I would consider building a second dwelling unit or a duplex on my property. But again, a majority would not. <clears throat> so that uh, concludes the presentation I have for this evening. I'm certainly happy to answer any questions you might have about the survey. And again, staff has uh, the complete report, which is uh, 150 pages or so of the report, and uh, or 200 actually, and then uh, literally thousands of pages of detailed cross tabs. Thank you, Brian. Any questions? I'm I'm kind of surprised, I guess, a little bit about the work from home. It seems like that number feels bigger to me personally than what you're showing. Well, I think it. I mean, it, first of all, it's would you would you like to, right? So it's ye yes or no for that for them. You know, the, the other part of the equation is, does your employer want you to, right? <clears throat> so uh, there may be some people that are not working from home uh, because their employer won't let them. Uh, and we didn't ask you that question. We yeah. just asked, would you like to work from home or would you continue working from home if you could? Okay. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Brian is Golden Empire now ready. Thanks. And uh, Becky, am I giving this back to you or am I giving it to Caltrans? No, uh, give it back to me. Okay. And thank you, Brian. Thank you. Apologies for the delay. Excellent. Good evening. My name is Robert Williams. I'm with the Golden Empire Transit District. Uh, I am the IT supervisor there. The gentleman that usually would give this presentation, Ricardo Perez, had another um, obligation and so uh, I will be giving today's presentation. Uh, GetBus continues to operate during COVID-19. Um, the fixed route service is listed here and you can see that in the yellow line was what we were providing pre-COVID. The uh, blue line was during the first year and that the green line is our current run. Uh, you can see that there's still a significant difference between where we were pre-COVID and the rides that we are providing in fixed route now. And on demand, which is our demand response, smaller vehicles, uh, different kind of area, less uh, obviously fixed route. Um, we uh, rebranded in April of 21. Um, we currently run three sub services in that particular piece, which is a micro transit product, which is on demand. Uh, paratransit product, which is booked in advance, and an NEMT, which is kind of a split of the two, that is a qualified Medi-Cal program uh, where we provide medical rides. Um, we do that in partnership with Kern Family Healthcare, uh, and as you can see from the monthly ridership by service modes, uh, those particular pieces have not fallen off much uh, during the COVID uh, uh, crisis. Uh, we saw much less uh, of a drop-off and have seen more recovery. In fact, I think if we had the resources, we probably would be able to produce more rides than we did pre-COVID uh, right now. Uh, um, okay, sorry, I'm having to go off of notes. It's a new presentation for me. Uh, we have a new product called On Demand Assist that we will be launching in July of this year. 
Uh, it is the takeover for the CTSA program that North of the River was running uh, all around Bakersfield. Uh, we have changed the uh, area a little bit, but are largely expanding our service area to incorporate most of their service area and what they were providing, as well as the area that's around our uh, fixed route designation, three quarters of a mile. Let's see if this is the right, that's the right one. So as you can see from this uh, map, the original uh, paratransit area that we were running is the white boundary. The green area is what we will be running for CTSA uh, as well as the paratransit system uh, when we start that program in July of uh, 2022. Uh, we are running the CTSA program on demand assist uh, as a qualified low income 60 plus uh, service. Uh, there will be income based qualifications which are self um, administered. Uh, it's a similar service area to what the CTSA is now. And our proposed fare structure is a little different than NORs but uh, will allow us to capture uh, a better recovery based on mileage uh, zero to three miles being two dollars, seven plus miles being five dollars, and anything in between. Compared to our micro transit rides, it's just about half. GET yeah, will also be expanding the micro transit product uh, up into the area of Oildale, which will now also include Pegasus Drive, which we had not been servicing for quite some time. Uh, will also include Meadows Field and the uh, Amazon Distribution Center, which is probably right now our most requested stop. Uh, that will take place the same July of 22. Um, we have proven that the service is successful in the southwest and have expanded that area a couple of times, um, and we are hoping to expand it even more during the course of the next couple of years. Uh, it has shown consistent growth before and during COVID, uh, and we would expect that, like I said, if we had more resources, we would be able to provide more and more rides every single day. Um, we have uh, introduced something new, and we actually are, are almost leading the nation in this regard in that we are commingling those groups. So instead of running those services as separate pieces, we are running them... We are running them uh, all together so that a microtransit rider might ride at the same time as a paratransit rider. At least that's what we're hoping to do in July. Uh, right now we run them as a little bit separate but sort of commingled. Um, and we expect to see some great efficiency gains uh, and a, a great resource uh, drop. Uh, from the simulation that we did, we expected to see a 25% drop in the need for vehicles and drivers uh, and a 25% increase in efficiencies. Uh, with those particular pieces on the same days with the same schedules uh, that we ran the simulation against. So it looks to be a, a very beneficial thing. Uh, we will have more information on that in the coming months. Uh, the operational analysis, Build Better Transit, that was uh, conducted by um, Golden Empire Transit recently uh, and has been presented on to our board, um, was launched in the fall of 22, uh, uh, sorry, the fall of 21. Um, the primary focus of the study were the routes in red, which are the 84, 82, 92, and 47, which are generally our least productive routes and ones we have been discussing how to make better for quite some time. Um, the two graphs in the survey, uh, most respondents identified that GET should explore, explore later weeknight service. The blue graph at the bottom, that was their number one request. Uh, and that it's perceived that it takes too long to travel by bus, which is the green graph at the bottom. Um, and this leads uh, into our potential improvement strategies, uh, which are to make some changes using both on-demand and making some changes to fixed route. Uh, we expect uh, to run a feeder service uh, for microtransit which will ultimately replace those underperforming fixed routes. Uh, you can see the areas in red, yellow, blue, and green. Uh, those would be areas where we would provide on-demand rides for about the price of the fixed route service uh, between a bus stop that is actually running uh, and a door or curb service um, from that area. Uh, we would expect to provide 30-minute frequency on all other local routes 
uh, and we would be more able to do that as better warranted by the ridership. Um, we would strengthen the transit grid uh, with all routes in now connecting to at least one hub, which we have some that do not at this point. Um, and, and that seems to uh, be something that would uh, improve ridership quite a bit. Uh, we would expand access to the south and west side fixed routes, uh, again, with that microtransit feeder service. Um, so we would remove, for example, the Route 84 and put in this feeder route local service for on-demand, um, still keeping the uh, regular on-demand service, NEMTs, commingled services, um, but allowing the riders to, instead of riding a fixed route bus, which we have to keep out there with almost no ridership, uh, they would be able to call that, make that an on-demand trip, and then be able to feed right directly to the bus network. Uh, we would also be able, from this service uh, and strategy, to deploy more express service, uh, which would reduce regional transit times. Um, and, and more about the on-demand uh, service development. Uh, on-demand premium, uh, which we may brand it, we may not, uh, is like the existing on-demand service introduced in 2019. It reaches uh, customers who do not generally use fixed route transit, which we have found. Uh, it provides direct travel uh, from curb to curb, from address to address within the get service area. And a premium service fee or fare would be charged for that service. Uh, again, uh, the zero to three miles being $3, 10 plus miles being $10, uh, and then the two breakouts in between. We see our average somewhere between the three and five dollar mark uh, in, in the months that we've studied. Um, and so that area would run, again, with an oil dale area as well, um, using those particular mileages. Uh, the on-demand local service, which was the feeder service that I talked about, is a new microtransit variation designed for customers who need affordable transportation, short distance trips, which would feed into the fixed route network. It expands the reach of the get fixed route to new customers, hopefully more people who are willing to ride on a smaller vehicle or get closer service to their house in neighborhoods. Uh, it selectively replaces the unproductive fixed routes in low density areas uh, and uses already existing community bus stops uh, instead of a curb to curb address to address service. Fares would be comparable to fixed route rather than distance based uh, and would include free transfers to fixed routes at designated transfer points. Other ideas that we've got ahead, obviously the uh, one that I've mentioned is expanding fixed route into the Oildale community, which we know we are going to do in July of 22. Uh, implement on-demand assist, the old CTSA program, also in July of 22. Further develop the service improvement strategies that we've discussed here and others that we may choose uh, as early as fall of 2022, uh, but it will largely be dependent on resource levels, workforce levels, uh, and what we can provide. Um, and then we will also continue to develop uh, hydrogen fuel cell buses. We have more on order, uh, currently have five on the road and uh, are looking forward to building our hydrogen station and getting that program up and running. So yes, uh, thank you. So the, uh, the CTSA service, uh, something I didn't mention is that the original service was run eight to five Monday through Friday. Uh, we are expanding that service and running it Monday through Sunday, seven days a week from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. just like we do on all of our other demand response services. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions or comments from anyone in the room. Thank you. Do we have any questions? I just want to make a quick comment. I just want to thank Robert and his staff and, and of course, Ricardo, Ricardo, who's not here, our operations manager. Um, they've taken this CTSA uh, challenge, and I think they've, they've come up with a good uh, program to, to serve those folks that, that need that service and expanding on demand in uh, Oildale area is, is another um, task that people uh, that they took on and I just want to say thank you for, for doing such a good job. Thank you. We've, uh, we've worked hard on that, uh, that program. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate, uh, you know, NOR decided to get out of the business and we appreciate Get stepping up and, and taking that over. Thank you. Thank you. Consent agenda, opportunity for public comment. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by KernCog staff and will be approved by one motion if no member of the council or public wishes to comment or ask questions. 
comment or discussion is desired by anyone, the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered in the listed sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council concerning the item before action is taken. Does anybody wish to remove anything from the consent agenda? Seeing and hearing none, can I have a motion? Second. I make a motion. Thank you. Roll call vote. Couch. Yes. Blades. Aye. Crump. Yes. Tafoya. Yes. Flores. Yes. Cryer. Yes. Navarro. Yes. Lisenovich. Yes. Para. Yes. Prout. Yes. Raina. Yes. Scrivener. Aye. Bob Smith. Yes. Phil Smith. Yes. Trujillo. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Public review draft 2022 regional transportation plan, draft environmental impact report, draft 2023 federal transportation improvement program, and corresponding draft air quality conformity analysis. Ms. Pacheco. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. The public review period of the Kern Cog long and near term federal transportation documents is currently underway. All documents are available on the Kern Cog website. Comments are due June 16th. A public hearing was conducted on Tuesday, May 17th at the Shafter City Council meeting, and tonight will be the second public hearing. Please note that Jessica Kirshner Flores from Impact Sciences is attending virtually tonight and is available for questions on the environmental impact report. At this time, I ask the chair to please open the public hearing, allow for public comment, and then close the public hearing. Thank you. We will now open the public hearing. Any public comment? Nothing online? I don't see anything. And nothing here. So I will close the public hearing. Item 6, 2021 Federal Transportation Improvement Program, draft amendment number 12, Ms. Pacheco. Amendment number 12 includes revisions to the transit program. The public review period ends May 20th. The Kern Cog Executive Director will consider approval of the amendment on May 23rd. State and federal approval is required. At this time, I ask the chair to please open the public hearing, allow for public comment, and then close the public hearing. Public hearing is now open. Do we have any comments? We have no comments, so I will close the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Caltrans report. District Thank six. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Michael. Members of the board, good evening, everyone. A um, couple of items before I give my project update. Just want to promote, promote that May is bike month. So our district had our, was during National Bike to Work weekday, so we had our event on Monday where several Caltrans employees, including myself, rode our bicycles to work. Um, so I figured if I could do the 12 mile round trip or 12 miles each way, I think most of us can because I don't proclaim to be in the best <laughs> bicycle shape. So um, just, just encourage you to get out there, ride your bike, especially right now while the weather's nice. Um, today I listened in on the uh, USDOT had a webinar on reconnected communities, which is a new grant program coming out. Uh, we expect the NOFO out this summer. So it's a five year program. We'll have a billion dollars for uh, reconnecting communities. Um, eligible projects include um, infrastructure projects as well as uh, planning studies. So it's about $200 million per year, about 150 for infrastructure for capital improvements and about $50 million for planning grants. So um, these are basically to help reconnect communities that were divided by transportation infrastructure. So if any of your communities have any ideas that involve the state highway system, please feel free to reach out to me and my staff and see if we could compete for some of these funds. As for projects, the Bakersfield Freeway Connector Project, uh, the bridge widening on westbound 58 over 99 is complete. The new loop ramp connector from 58 to southbound 99 and the tunnel are now open. So new traffic pattern is, is currently active. Um, the project is about 85% complete and we anticipate having that project done by this winter. The 99 rehab Palm Avenue overcrossing 
uh, to Beardsley Canal Bridge. Um, currently, the pavement is complete and, and the concrete's curing. Uh, remaining work includes the final striping, complete the traffic loops, as well as some punchless items. At State Route 178 and Buck Owens Boulevard, uh, still need to complete the barrier at the loop ramp, stamp concrete and sidewalk, and complete final striping with some punchless items as well. So we anticipate having that wrapped up uh, by end of June. The um, old U the State Route 99, old US 99 to White Lane Rehab Project. Uh, they're continuing with removing of the eucalyptus trees. Uh, work currently ongoing includes lowering the freeway inside lanes and the northbound off-ramp and on-ramp at State Route 223 it remains closed and should be reopened uh, later this month. The State Route 223 Derby Signal Project, that project is 100% complete and was signed off on May 4th. The State Route 184 Sunset Roundabout Project, uh, the contract was approved. Some utility re relocations in progress before the actual construction commences and we expect construction to start, actual construction to start on August of this year. The Arvin State Route 223 and State Route 184 Roundabout, that contract was recently approved and construction began on May 1st. The Union Avenue uh, High Intensity uh, Activated Crosswalk, so the Hawk, um, that project RTL back in December. So bids open April 19th and the project was recently awarded to the Griffith Company on May 9th, so trying to get that contract wrapped up so we can get that much needed project out to construction. The Santa Fe Roundabout, this is a longer lead project in spring of 2025, but we did just uh, circulate the, the draft environmental document on April 29th for public comment. And lastly, State Route 46, Segment 4B. So this is the one where the girder failed. So um, the replacement girder, um, to replace the replace to replace the failed girder um, is scheduled to fabricate and cure then ship to the job late next month uh, it's going to be shipped in three pieces and then we'll be need to be spliced and post tension in the field so when those girders come they're precast they're 70 foot sections that'll come to the job site they anticipate the bridge work uh, restarting in august um, caltrans and granite have agreed to a workaround plan to enable some road work to resume completion so the contractor is scheduling the subs and looking to remobilize and resume road work in the next two to three weeks. Um, I can't lie, that wasn't my last project. Um, State Route 166 Maricopa, Cap Hi Maricopa Highway project. So this is a, um, a pavement rehabilitation project for about nine miles from State Route 33 uh, to Capello Street. So we're currently getting that draft environmental document ready to circulate. Um, it will advertise next summer 2023. I know we've talked about the crosswalk relocation, so we're not going to relocate the crosswalk. We're going to add an additional crosswalk. So we'll be adding, a, we'll keep the, cost, the crosswalk at Kern Street. We'll go ahead and enhance that one, and then we'll add another one at State Route 33 at the location you requested, and hopefully some other complete streets elements as that project moves forward. And now the last project I promised, left turn channelization at Taft project. So it's all left turn channel on State Route 119 at the Kern Street Airport Road. Um, that project RTL on April 15th, and we expect construction to start this fall. With that, that completes my report. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I just had a couple comments. Uh, I seen the uh, green paint and the bicycle lanes on Rosedale Highway underneath 99, and that really helps. It really looks good. I don't know if you've went out and looked at it. I haven't seen it, that. I'm a, big, yeah. I'm a big fan of green paint. It's one of the yeah. conflict points, so I'm glad we're yeah. doing that. Yeah. That's There's a lot of, I'm, I was surprised it was easier to fix. I was, I was amazed how much that paint cost. <laughs> it's actually really expensive per square foot, but I'm, I'm glad we're actually doing that. Yeah. It should be. Really looks good. Thank good. you. Uh, appreciate that. And I just want to, you know, make another push on the Friant Kern. You know, the city of Bakersfield is looking forward to that. And if you can help push that over the final yeah. hump, I'd appreciate I'm that. I'm trying, Aaron. I've been talking yeah. in, um, the director been talking and that the uh yeah are having a little right-of-way challenge internally trying to push back on those and involve the director so we'll, we'll talk tomorrow again great thank so, you thank you chair any other comments for mr navarro hearing none district nine thank you krista good evening mr chairman uh members of the board thank you um sure sorry about that um, first off, I want to thank Kern Cog for supporting our application for the rural grant for the SR58 truck cr climbing lane. We have completed that application, submitted to our headquarters, and it will be move on on Friday. Um, so we are continuing to look for other opportunities for funding for that project, and we have some other grants in kind of the pipeline that we're looking to complete as well. 
we have a Freeman Gulch safety project that's going to open for uh, public review of the project initiation document next week. So um, the major component, that will be on State Route 14 in the segment that is still just two lanes. So what we're looking for is the major component will be to widen the shoulders, to widen the median, to stripe the med median barrier, to allow no passing, and to install rumble strips. We're looking for public comment on possible project add-ons, which would include a passing lane, uh, both northbound and southbound near Robber's Roost, or and or um, modification of the SR-14 and SR-178 West intersection. This week, um, the Tehachapi City Council voted to authorize acceptance of grant funds of over $2 million from the Caltrans Clean California program for a new one-acre park facility on Valley Boulevard. We're excited about that. The city of Tehachapi proposed a new park on a vacant piece of land owned by the city located on Valley Boulevard. So we'll be moving forward with that. Um, D9 participated in the Tehachapi Bike Rodeo last Saturday. It was a really nice event, well done, and so I'm hoping that we can do that again and, and increase attendance in the future. And then we have the Bike Month Scavify Scavenger Hunt online through May. And so District 9 also appreciates Kern County letter, letting us partner in this activity. Uh, we have a link to the app is posted every two days on the district's social media page. And we have over 99 participants registered already. So, As far as pro uh, project updates, I'm sorry to have to report that we're still working on the Rosamond Mojave Rehabilitation Project on State Route 14. We have one section of the pavement that failed, and so the one of the southbound lanes continues to be closed. We're having supply chain issues with the um, acquisition of rebar, so that's going to probably go on for five or six weeks. And the speed limit will continue to be 55 miles per hour within that project. We have some utility work happening on State Route 178. Um, on Friday from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. at two locations, one between Easy Street and the end of Canbrake Creek Bridge, another between the junction of State Route 14 and Airport Road in Inyokern. And so drivers may experience delays of up to 20 minutes in those locations. And then we have a couple projects that we uh, anticipate no delays or minimal delays on, and that's the Keene Road crack seal operation on State Route 58 between Keene Road and the junction of State Route 202 in Tehachapi, and the Ridgecrest Pavement Repair on State Route 178 between Ridgecrest Boulevard and South Gateway Boulevard. That's it for my report. Thank you. Any comments or questions for District 9? I, I have a Quick. question, Mr. Oh. Chairman. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Let you go. So, uh, Kirsten, can, just to confirm the conversation we had um, yesterday or the day before about the truck climbing lane application. Did I understand you correctly when you said Caltrans was going to submit three rural projects and one has dropped out, so now we are one of only two projects in the state competing for those federal funds? District 1 dropped out, yes. So that's that's good news. Yeah. Good, good news for us, bad news for <laughs> District 1. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? Hi, this is this is Phil uh, in uh, Tatchby. Yes. I just want to say thanks for all the efforts, uh, continuing efforts on truck climbing lane applications for grants and funding, uh, and then the uh, the rehab work that you're going to be doing between Keene and Tatchby. And I noticed on on District Six's six side as well, the uh, the pavement pothole repair is. I, I've been noticing it and getting comments back. And thank you on both sides. Uh, and then the uh, the park uh, on Valley Boulevard, it was just, it was very uh, uh, well received. That we, we were just curious how Caltrans could assist us uh, for that, and but we were very happy to get that grant with, with your help. And it, we're going to put it to really good use. It's in a neighborhood that's underserved, so that two million dollar park project is going to go a long way to helping some uh, uh, younger people in that area. So. Thanks for all your efforts on everything that you're doing. I really appreciate it. Thank you. That's good to hear. Any other comments? Kirsten? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Kirsten, this is Kyle Blade, City of Ridgecrest. Yes. Um, uh, thank you for the work you guys have done on 178, and those lights going in, are, I think, are going to be great for the community. 
a quick question. The when do you believe the lights will be actually turned on? I do not know the answer to that. I can check check on it and follow up with you. Thank you so much. Sure. Ms. Barra. I, I just had one real quick um, to thank District 9 for uh, uh, showing up there at the bike rodeo and CHP showed up. Uh, the Bike Bakersfield staff was very impressed with uh, the work that you all did out there and um, helping with putting that together and we look forward to next year possibly doing it again and that scavenger hunt we've got more people than last year are doing it and even in the outlying areas so that's that's uh we get people showing up to the shop every day as part of the scavenger hunt you know so um thank you all very much for doing that that's great i heard really great things about the um, bike rodeo so i'm excited to do that again Thanks. Good. Thank you. Uh, hearing no other comments, we will adjourn the TPPC meeting and begin the Kern Council of Governments meeting. Same roll call, I assume. And any public comments? Any comments online? Miss Napier? Thank you. No, sir. Uh, consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by Kern Cog staff and will be approved by one motion if no member of the council or public wishes to comment or ask questions. If comment or discussion is desired by anyone, the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered in the listed sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council concerning the item before action is taken, does anybody wish to remove an item off of the consent agenda? Seeing none, can I have a vote? Motion, Motion. to approve. Second. Roll call vote. Trujillo. Yes. Phil Smith. Yes. Bob Smith. Yes. Scribner. Aye. Raina. Aye. Prout. Yes. Lisenovich. Yes. Cryer. Yes. Tafoya. Yes. Crump. Yes. Blades. Aye. And Couch. Yes. <coughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry I skipped the executive director's report. You, you'll have to double up on your next one. Uh, item five, election of officers. Ms. Napier. Yes, sir. Um, typically, we do this in um, April, so I, we're a month behind. And that's, I, I overlooked that, so I apologize. Uh, but we use we do this every year to select a, a chairman and a vice chairman for the cog for the cog board and at this time if uh the oh the vice chair isn't here i guess i'll i will take um nominations for chairman or no you wait a minute you take nominations for chairman i'm sorry <laughs> thank you can we have <laughs> do we have any nominations for chairman Hi, this is Phil Smith and Tashby. I recommend we uh, retain uh, Bob Smith as chair and and the vice chair. Uh, just keep them both the same. That's my motion. Do we have any other nominations? I, I want to second the motion. That was the same. Uh, we have a motion and a second. I hear no other nominations. Is that a roll call vote? I think you could do voice vote. Voice vote. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Because of the resolution, we have to do roll call. Sorry. I'm blowing it tonight. Roll I'm call sorry. vote, please. <laughs> <laughs> Couch. Yes. Blades. Aye. Crump. Yes. Tafoya. Yes. Cryer. Yes. Lisenovich. Yes. 
Prout. Yes. Reyna. Yes. Scribner. Aye. Bob Smith. Yes. Phil Smith. Yes. And Trujillo. Yes. Thank you, and thank you for your continued support. Executive Director. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and board members. I have uh, about a half dozen items between uh, the two agendas. On May 18th and 19th, the CTC met in Fresno, which is a rare event. <coughs> they met in Fresno um, in honor of the new, <coughs> excuse me, CTC chairwoman, Leanne Ager. Um, one of the things the CTC is discussing is the negotiations between the legislature and the governor, and there is still the potential that um, there will be significantly more money before the um, uh, for next fiscal year in specifically ATP type projects. So I ur urge all of you um, that represent your cities or the county to get your um, ATP applications in. They're due in the middle of next month. Um, yesterday evening I attended a reception uh, in honor of the new CTC chairman. I got to uh, meet with several of the CTC commissioners, along with um, the acting director of Caltrans, the district director of Caltrans, district director of Caltrans District 5 that has some projects that are of interest um, to you. It was a, a very productive, um, productive hour and a half. Next CTC meeting is uh, June 29th and 30th. The, op the adoption of the 2022 ATP Cycle 6, which I mentioned a minute ago. Uh, again, I will remind everyone, applications are due June 15th. And um, our policy at Kern Cog, adopted by this board, is, is you need to apply for the state funds first. Um, all the projects that are funded uh, by the state um, will, will go down that list. And then we will continue down that list to fund the projects with the MPO's share of that fund, which is the largest it has ever been. Um, over the past month, I've had uh, continued meetings on State Route 99 and 58, missing connectors, 204, also known as Union Avenue, 7 Standard and 43, improvements on State Route 33, safety improvements. Thank you to Caltrans to keeping an open mind on that. Um, we continue to meet on Route 46, both the projects in Kern County and uh, I briefly mentioned we are concerned about projects in San Luis Obispo County moving forward and also the truck climbing lanes on State Route 58. Also during the month I um, was honored to attend the Bitwi Bitwise Business Leaders Lunch on April 25th. They've really done a great job in uh, converting that space into um, uh, new uses. And uh, Ms. Napier, Mr. Ball, and I attended the San Joaquin Valley Policy Conference last week in Clovis. It was a productive meeting, um, attended many seminars, uh, and met uh, some people in person who I hadn't seen in some cases in years. And finally, in your folder this evening is the timeline covering May, June, and July a flyer for the 8th Annual Electric Vehicle Test Drive events covering both uh, Fresno and Bakersfield, uh, s a um, information sheet on alternative fuel trucks in the San Joaquin Valley, summary of our very successful Transitions 2022 Transit Symposium, an advanced technology um, information pamphlet on uh, alternative fuels and transit, and finally a schedule of cash disbursements covering uh, March of 2022. Subject to any of your questions, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you. Do any members have any comments or questions? Hearing none, we are adjourned.